podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode of The Therapy Show. And this week we're back to normal with Mr. Bob Cook after having his wonderful wife here doing a guest appearance last week. So this week, Bob, we're going to be looking at working with the histrionic or hysterical client. Is hysterical an old fashioned way of talking about histrionic? Oh, yeah, yeah. Hysterical, really. Well, yes, that's right. And no, I mean, we in the good back. old days, those women used to get called hysterical and put away in mental institutions for lots of things, didn't we? Yeah, of course. Yeah, oh, I've got somebody. To, yeah, somebody got, I think I had an apple and the skin's left there. Yeah, <laughs> if we go right the way back in time, Freud called, had the term hysteric and included everything, almost all... Um, went under the sort of label of uh, hysterics, you know, anxiety, depression, manic yeah. depression, uh, all went under the term hysteric. And you're quite correct, actually. Um, in the, a good film uh, talking about Freud and Jung, and I can't remember who was in it, but um, they talked a lot about different diagnoses. And it seemed like it was a like hysteric was a sort of catch phrase for many diagnoses yeah correct in a way but today it's a bit different people talk about hysteronic and they talk about hysteronic personality disorders and hysteronic traits yeah um you've done that in your training yes yeah yeah so one of the things is kind of over emotional a lot of the time would you say the it, it enthusiastic overreactor it's it's sometimes known as yeah in the book by personal adaptations by van joins and ian stewart yeah when they talk about the different uh, channels and different diagnoses is when they talk about histrionic that's how they talk about it and they talk about the major way of contacting histrionic if they come in the room is through feelings yeah as you see somebody who's sort of a paranoid nature you would contact them through thinking yeah um so yes that's the way that uh histrionics will um conduct their narrative through feelings everything's yeah. through feelings the way you talked about and often the histrionic traits we're talking about will be people 17 and 18 onwards so it's more of a later diagnosis developmentally and um they're usually people who have problems with emotional regulation yeah and everything is through feelings just as you've said it and of course part of the treatment plan is to help them think and feel yeah now so eric Byrne, who's the creative transaction analysis would talk a lot about helping the histrionic developing um not only thinking but a grounded adult where they can use their thinking rather than just coming from an all feeling place. Yeah, which I've worked with clients at Histrionic and it's it's really visual. You can see it happening before your eyes, which I think you don't always see that with the other traits. You know, there's there's a, a, a confused look when you're trying to get them back into their thinking. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Love Island, which is a f sort of well-known uh, reality television program, which is quite popular at the moment, isn't it? And it's that program where the uh, sort of adolescents, well, they aren't adolescents, but they act that way. They regress that way from about 19 to 26 year olds, aren't they? Or 19 to 20. Yeah. They're, you know, a villa in Mallorca and they sort of um, have to spend five or six weeks there. Well, I was watching an episode last night. And I wish I could put that episode on now for you when we're talking about histrionic traits, because this person was a perfect example of histrionic uh, uh, traits, very lacking in any emotional regulation. And everything was about feelings and thinking had gone out the window. Yeah. And, uh, and if I could have stepped into that villa, I would have encouraged her to 
actually integrate a feeling and a thinking, which is really the treatment plan for people with uh, um, this type of personality trait. You're absolutely right. They're, they're very visual, aren't they? And they're very uh, uh, extravagant and very emotional. And there's a lot going on. Yeah. It's very dramatic. And most of the issues that they come with will be from relationships. Yeah. How to be and how not to be in relationships. That's usually what they come with. People yeah. Because they have tremendous uh, difficulties with emotional regulation. So uh, relationships become a difficult area for them. So I was looking up some of the characteristics as I'll read out to you. I thought, oh, I'll, I'll read some out. Um, you, you, so here we go. The DSM-4, that's the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, defines histrionic traits in this way. One, exhibitional behaviour. Yeah. yeah. It's a bit like you were just describing there. They're highly intense in their behaviour and highly exhibitionist. That's a good for a dyslexic person like me to say it, but and it's an <laughs> exhibitionist behaviour. Yeah. And, and you are quite right. They, they appear quite dramatically visual yes. in the therapy process. Would you think of it that way? Yeah, yeah. They, I would imagine on a night out, they'd be the one that's dancing on the table and being, you know, very exuberant and larger than life a lot of the time. Very dramatic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if somebody said something, it would cut them through to the core and it would be a massive deal that they probably wouldn't get over. Yeah, so the highly sensitive people. Yeah, in the toilets crying at the end of the night. So... Uh, second one here, they're consistent or those, you know, constant in seeking of reassurance or approval. So they need constant reassurance or approval. Yeah. Now, in the transactionized literature, that is one of the big uh, hallmarks of the histrionic traits, if you like, is that they have had, haven't had enough stroking or positive stroking in their parent parenting process. So there's significant other people haven't um, stroked them consistently uh, in a positive way. So in relationships, these types of people that we're talking about here are constantly seeking positive, in TA again, strokes is a unit of social recognition. They're always seeking constant approval or reassurance from the other. Yeah. So, they, so in a relationship, they, they, like putting it in layman's terms, they'd be really needy. They would need a lot of mm. attention and asking all the time whether that was okay and am I good enough and all those sorts of things. Yeah. Right, and a negative frame might be that they're attention seekers. Yeah. Which is a shame, really, to label um, these this person with that lay label of attention seeking but uh for the sake of this podcast that's the case yeah that they because are they, they, would you connect that with their sense of self that because they didn't get recognition and validation when they were growing up that they kind of need the narrative to know that what they're doing is okay correct to keep Absolutely. checking in with the other person yeah Absolutely. they're so sensitive to criticism yeah and any slight criticism they take very, very personally. And it's as if their world has collapsed. Yeah. So a therapist will need to be very careful in, in this process uh, because you need to enable them to, or encourage them to think as well as feel. So it isn't enough to just give these people, you know, a consistent positive stroking pattern or consistent reinsurance. I mean, that, that has to go there, but there needs to be a narrative around, you know, what's the deficits? Where's, where's this sort of reparative behavior come from? You know, what, what's beneath all this lot? Yeah. So you, know, you need to go into their parenting processes, but they're very, very um, distraught if any criticism comes their way. Yeah. Personal level. Yeah. Would you say that even if they get praise, that they'll seek even more of it? Yes. That when you do, they do get it, they kind of discount it and go in for another 
hit of it, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, you described it very well when you said over needy. Yeah. So they may appear over needy. And, uh, and you're quite right, they discount often the level of recognition and reassurance they might get. And what they remember avidly is anything they may take as criticism. Yeah. So in a, if you watch, say, five minutes of discussions in this Love Island program talking about somebody who's histrionic, um, they may be told many, many times that they are, you know, OK or, 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 or positive stroking in that way, but they'll remember the negative criticism. Yeah. So you're correct. That's right. They become... Nothing satisfies them, really, yeah. because of the deficit in the parenting. Which is sad. Mm. Yeah. Oh, it is. And, you know, some of the ones that, that I can remember working with, there's lots of overthinking. They'll go back, you know, if, they go, if they've been out with their mates, say, during the day, they will overthink every conversation that they've had during the evening, whether it was good enough or... Did I say the wrong thing? Was that right? You know, yeah. Yeah. they avoided me. They didn't say to all to me, whatever it is. Yeah, and they'll remember the criticism of the yeah. what they see as critical behaviour. Yeah. So they have a high internal negative critic. Yeah. And they um, have a real big need for approval, as we talked about before. So another characteristic we've got through to is what I just you and I have just been talking about: excessive sensitivity to criticism or disapproval. Mm. Cover that. Next, pride of own personality and unwillingness to change, viewing any change as a threat. So, in other words, they're, they're quite though they've got an expansive personality. They're often stuck in black and white thinking. Yeah. Around the lines we're talking about. Yeah. So change is often threatening for them. Yeah. Which is a catch-22 situation when they come into therapy. <laughs> yeah, very much so. And um, I would recommend, you know, put, especially if you if you run psychotherapy groups, is that you put them in a group. Would they want to be in a group, though? I think it's the best place for them uh, in the sense of this is all about relationship issues. Yeah. And therefore, there's, they will see how other people relate to other people and they will see what is, in inverted commas, normal and not normal. And they'll get more clarity around how, how, how uh, appropriate behaviour is actually within relationships. And I think what you're hinting at, really, is and I didn't mean to actually uh, say go straight in a group um, because I'm a very much believe in attachment and attachment theory. Yeah, but I think that there needs to be maybe three or four months with the therapist, but not to stay like in individual therapy for a particularly long time because I think they gain more in groups. They need to have a strong relationship with the therapist so they can handle what might be perceived as negative criticism and always be able to have an, a constant object in terms of positive recognition. But I yeah. do think I see more growth in groups. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I can see them kind of struggling with that transition. Mm -hmm. if, however, if they've attached to you and they can, they can hold on to you as a positive supply of recognition, if you like, yeah. a positive supply of appreciation and you and you are able to help them think through their emotions rather than yeah. always spontaneously uh dealing with emotions but if you can help them think their way through this so they can think and feel at the same time it'll become a value you you know the whole process becomes invaluable yes oh yeah 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 i can i can see why that that's a, a you know a really good thing to do. I think I was just thinking that they might see that as I don't want to say you abandoning them, but but not having that important one-on-one -on -one relationship. If suddenly they were with a group that you 
I don't know. Do they think that they're overwhelming? Do they? Yes. Yeah. You see, that's why I think normalisation in a group is really important. Yeah. You see, I think the personality traits character that you wouldn't put in a group uh, until you've done a lot of work would be the narcissistic traits where they have to see themselves as special. Yeah. And then they will feel very abandoned by you. Yeah. So, so this, see, when people in psychotherapy groups, I think they need to think very carefully about what personalities they put into a group um, and when they put them into groups and the timing of when they put them into groups for the various reasons you're talking about. So I, I would hesitate putting anybody with narcissistic traits into a group uh, very early in therapy, if ever, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be in the later stages of therapy treatment anyway. Well, if someone's histrionic, or I've got those types of traits we're talking about here, I think if they've got a good attachment to their therapist, then a group's a very good ground to learn the normal and uh, normalizing processes of relationships. Yeah. But it is an interesting one to consider as a therapist is would they feel abandoned by the therapist moving from individual to group the question I, I, I the way i look at it is that most of the categories and styles we're talking about here would run the potential of feeling abandoned by the therapist so it's the transition yes yeah across which becomes really important yeah because i see that that moving into either moving into the ending of therapy or moving from individual into a group is kind of like a transition like we do when we're growing up that individuation and separation you you know they, they don't become dependent on the therapist uh, to a certain extent yeah that's a nice way to look at it. another way to look at it is this is developmentally yeah so borderline who we, we're going to talk about in another in another podcast um they have problems in developmentally in the individuation separation phase dramatically. Narciss narcissistic, the same, really. Antisocials, I think, very similarly. But when we're talking about the histrionic uh, person, their issues are really later developmentally. And because they're later developmentally, I think they will get more out of a group. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're saying later developmentally, do they do a lot of comparing and contrasting yes. then? Is that kind of the stage that they're at where? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. You've got that's absolutely correct. Yeah. A lot of the hurts and traumas have come from the adolescence period for the histronic. Yeah. And they therefore they're, they're, they, they will get a lot out of uh, being in groups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be, be, that sense of belonging and, and being in a group and things, yeah. Working things through. Yeah, yeah. I, I always think they do tremendously well in terms of, you know, health. Healthy processes in groups. Where some of these narcissistic, borderline, even schizoids, uh, withdrawn people have more challenges in groups, I think. You know, I think somebody who's withdrawn and somebody's hysteronic, you think would balance each other off. And they do in a way. And it's all, and you know, perhaps we'll do a podcast on it, what we need to consider when group, yeah. We put people in a psychotherapy group, because I think there is a lot to consider. Certainly in the levels of developmental processes yeah that we need to think about when working with people we could do a whole series on that Bob. yeah yeah well, we, we could go on to one of my i ran psychotherapy groups for 31 years i've never run a group so so that should be a good podcast i i could get an awful lot from that i run groups online like you know thing but not not therapy group i've never done one so i'm count me in on that one bob yeah it'd be a wonderful podcast and something i quite like to do it need to have two podcasts i mean so much to concentrate on uh one would be obviously who go you know who goes into a psychotherapy group 
but you got all the things about how long a psychotherapy group should be, what's the major criteria, advantages, strengths, weaknesses of groups, busy individual therapy. I could go on. We could do a whole series month or two just on doing groups, yeah. So I did run it for a long time and it was quite a sad <sighs> process for me when I ended my last psychotherapy group. Now, no, they don't, they, it, with the same people weren't in it for 36 years. I just want to sort of like tell the viewers that. People will be glad to hear it, that. It, it, <laughs> after. <laughs> it didn't sort of be the whole of the 31 years or 36 years, whatever it was. Uh, people did move on. It wasn't the same people, except yeah. for me, of course. Well, so looking at all of these personality types that, that we've done and maybe the histrionic one, you know, about building attachments. Oh. Is, is there a time scale for the length of time people should be in therapy as far as you're concerned? Well, let's take the word should out, but as a sort of, I don't want to say as a should, but in terms of reflecting on the level of the more there are some things I think about one of them would be the level of trauma yeah so if somebody's had a high level of trauma and it probably will take quite a lot of time in terms of healing yeah the more trauma somebody's had the more time they are likely to stay in therapy the more disturbed a person is which is often linked to the level of trauma they've had yeah more likely they'll need more time in therapy. So when we talk about the actual personality disorders rather than traits, they'll probably need more time in therapy. Yeah. It's yeah. Just going off track with the topic. It's just something that, that kind of came up for me this week that I'm, I was curious about that, you know, some clients I've seen for four years, you know, and it's kind of like, they, they could be okay out in the world, but they come to me on a weekly basis as part of their self-care routine. And I just wonder what your thoughts were on that. You know, if you're talking about the groups that you had, mm. that people attend groups on a monthly basis for quite a long time as part of their self-care, like going to the gym. You're right, it's a completely different... Uh, level of podcasts but I can answer that fairly straightforward I run groups weekly not monthly right so I run groups you know and often I run groups two three four five times a week but my groups tended to be two hours once a week yeah and you know some people came to those groups uh, in terms of the way that you were just talking about it they did a tremendous lot of healing and curing and healthiness and often would might stay for maintenance. Yeah, yeah. That's one way to look at it. And That's a nice word. I like that word. <laughs> yeah, and I don't want to take that away. And then you have the balance to reflect on as a therapist, and that is how many of those people might be staying there because they are over-dependent on the therapist rather yeah. than growing up, developing adult thinking and grounding and moving on in the world. Yeah. So it's a, a thing for, it's a process that therapists needs to think about because one of the criticisms could be laid at a therapist's feet, if that's not addressed, is that they stay dependent, young and infantile and never grow up from the therapist and then they're there for eight, nine, ten years. And in fact, um, all that's happened is that the, the actual developmental issues that we're talking about get stroked rather than the person developing developing autonomy and growing up mm. in fact at another level completely therapists could then be accused of and this is another level completely jackie's perhaps another podcast is taking money off the um the clients um when actually they should be promoting them to develop autonomy adulthood and move on yeah and maybe again you know that that would be another good topic to do you know around endings and whose job is it to decide when enough is enough the client or the therapist yeah and it's a really good podcast because it's actually many people say it would be should be the therapist's duty and then many people might say uh, it's the client so 
and then many other people say Mark, it should be a joint issue so that's a whole podcast in itself can i go on to another you can <laughs> another one of the, <laughs> onto the fourth one. this is an interesting one when i read it and i i reminds me of um this very very strongly and especially when i watch love I island the other day um uh, and it and this is it inappropriately seductive appearance or behavior of a sexual nature mm. in other words they're inappropriately sexual within the relationship and they do it to, i'm going to add something on this here this is really a desperate attempt for praise yeah yeah and I, I would hazard a guess with the females maybe the males as well that they got recognition for yes being yeah. beautiful or uh, and it will say because having good know, posture or whatever it is that's right. that's right because this is another huge podcast as well but you know uh because a lot of the statistics and research talk about histrionic traits mostly from the female perspective uh and they talk about, and I think it's a lot of cultural scripting in this rather than, I'd like to do research in this. And a lot of the schizoid behavior or the withdrawal clients from a male perspective. So, but uh, it's an interesting one about inappropriate sexual seductiveness. Um, and I think it's true, they attempt, but you see, it comes from a desperate attempt for praise. Yeah. Uh, and they get confused. And I agree with you society might stroke them for this yeah especially females yeah yeah i when as you're talking about it my kind of narrative that i'm running is you know a little girl and a daddy do you know what i mean daddy's little princess type yeah absolutely thing yeah yeah and of course unless the yeah god's sake my parent myself and your parents and there's no such thing as perfect parents and everything else goes with that but unless the father sort of reflects on this or understands it they may encourage this type of behavior inadvertently yeah 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 with the best of intention it, you know it's not that we we as parents we intentionally want to harm our children 99.9% .9 of the time yeah mm. Mm. but it can become problem for the uh uh, the client or the person if it leads them into dangerous or inappropriate situations in relationships yeah 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 so so that's an interesting one another um trait we've got here we've talked about craving attention this is an interesting low tolerance for frustration or delayed gratification oh interesting yeah you know what i mean by that jackie yeah yeah that everything has to be now instant yeah yeah spontaneously gotta yeah. have gotta have it gotta have it almost like from a self-indulgence place yeah so again I, I don't know why i'm you know stereotyping and everything but it's kind of like that shopaholic instant gratification you know if if i'm not feeling that good i'm gonna go out and spend mm. money so that i can feel better get my hair done get my nails done all that kind of stuff yeah and then I, then my self-esteem will be better and of course it's a, it's a trap isn't it yeah and it doesn't last yeah it doesn't last at all and that's why they would learn a lot from groups yeah 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 again they can normalize things in relationships and they're the one tendency to believe that relationships are more intimate than they actually are so i'll say it again tendency to believe that relationships are more intimate than they actually are so when you're talking about intimacy are you talking about the relationship as opposed to the sexual side of a relationship yes, i'm talking about the relationship well yeah the yeah 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 which i would imagine for histrionic it does play a big part in it but it's more about the the connection of being intimate and authentic and all that stuff yeah yeah so so they they um they sort of misjudge it yeah they misjudge levels of intimacy again another reason for groups yes yeah yeah it's all going towards groups for me um <clears throat> very highly spontaneous they often making rash decisions they're blaming personal failures or disappointments on other people 
they're easily influenced by other people, uh, especially those who treat them with high praise. They're very dramatic, very emotional, and they're highly influenced by suggestions of other people. Yeah, I can see all of that in some clients that I've worked with. I have some work colleagues as well, to be fair, that, you know, yeah. So the treatment is to help them really integrate thinking and feeling and from that introduce new behaviours. Yeah. So thinking yeah. is a really big part of the treatment. And, and uh, praise and recognition for thinking as opposed to the feeling side of things. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Even yeah. though you will, especially when you work at the beginning with people, you, you will increase the rapport and build up relationship through the discourse of emotions. But where you need to get to is to integrate thinking and feeling. So there's new opportunities for more healthy behaviours. Yeah especially in relationships. Yeah. They come, mostly they will come with confusion and relationship issues. Confusion is a word that I would use a lot around this personality mm. trait. <laughs> when when you're trying to connect with them through their thinking, mm. there's a lot of confusion. <laughs> they always want to go back to feelings. Yes, yeah, yeah. I, I know what this is. I don't, you, you're asking me to think and I don't know how to do that, particularly not when I'm in an emotional state. I can't think. It kind of shuts down. Yeah. That's right. So you build up the relationship through feelings, but you, it's all timing again. You need to move yeah. to help them integrate thinking and feeling. And also, this will come down usually to a developmental arrest in the adolescence stage of development yeah say a bit more about that well just think of the adolescent you, you, i know you do a lot in this area yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Just think of the adolescent period yes and think of the dramaticisms and highs and lows and um my daughter i i could count you know i could count on many 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 fingers i've only got 10 by 20 30 <laughs> 50 times and how many times my daughter in the adolescence periods has come to me in tears about what people have said to her on facebook or on instagram or whatever it is and the, uh, and they're attempting to work out how to be in relationship yeah and, yeah. and get your needs met within that relationship yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that's where the problems come for the histrionic yeah yeah, it's a nightmare, isn't it, to be a teenager and to feel that emotional about things. I can kind of relate to that, yeah. So I like working with these people, but I think they, I move them into groups. I don't run a group anymore, but in my practice for all that time, um, I retired clinically a couple of years ago, but I, I only stopped groups a year before that. So really until the last ebbers of my clinical life I was running groups and I used to put people with histrionic traits quicker than most into a group because it's all about relationship issues and it's all about working out their confusion and emotional regulation in groups and they 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 had a lot of vicarious learning now for people out there who aren't in groups it doesn't mean that you can't work uh, with people with historic traits individually um, but you need to enable them to um, think as well as feel. And one of the best ways to do that, I think, is to actually start using your own sense of self as a therapist in the relationship and to help them normalise what happens in a relationship and doesn't happen in a relationship. So that would demand the therapist using their sense of self from a clinical perspective to help the histrionic sort out uh, what they didn't sort out in that adolescent period we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. But thinking is the really important thing here, to help them to think about their emotions rather than just feel them spontaneously. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why, when you're talking and, and the thinking and everything, I just keep going back to journaling. You know, that that's something oh, that's that I great. would... Great say to a, a you know yeah, that sort yeah, of a yeah. client is to write down and journal and maybe bring that into the session the next time 
and we'll talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think with these clients, more than any other adaptation um, or style, we, the therapist's use of themselves is so important. Yeah. Because it's a relational disturbance that we're talking about. Yeah. It's 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 all very interesting stuff, this psychotherapy, isn't it, Bob? <laughs> yes, uh, I hope my wife talked avidly about antisocials because they can go together. Be I, I don't know if she touched about that at all, but, um, um, you know, I I think antisocials and hysteronics can go can get slightly um, misdiagnosed. But the thing about, uh, because of their charming ability of the antisocial, but the hysteronics really are going to be people 18, 19, 20, 20 and it's going to be after that sort of, uh, it's that developmental period and it's all about relationships and normalisation and the therapist can use their sense of self to help the person sort out the confused relationship. Yeah. And they're very, I tell you what about this type of person, I find the very uh, I like working with them because they so um, they bring their emotions. There's a lot going on. And it's very dramatic, and if I don't think about it, I can get drawn into the drama and the excitement and the seduction and goodness knows what. And that might be right at the beginning to help building up the relationship. But your job is not to get dragged along with that. It's to enable them to think about all this. Yeah. You also to go back to the history and to talk about, you know, helping them think what was missing in those times. And, and some things you're going to come across is how how often may they've been bullied or gaslighted or whatever. And they're very, they're very sensitive to all these criticisms and they attempt to sort all this out by, you know, their, their OB need, neediness or their sexual inappropriateness or whatever we, what, what we want to phrase this. But, you know, I think therapists can step into the relationship and really help here and uh, help a person sort out their confusion. Yeah. From a thinking position. Yeah. Yeah, I quite like working with them, but I'm a thinker, so I go in there thinking anyway. <laughs> oh, so for you, it's quite a, it's quite a, uh, uh, a delight, I would think, to help them, help them looking at the, uh, how to think and feel at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, I like journaling. I think you can do homework with these people quite well. Well, that's one of the things that I I do do with that type of person. And I've often, I'm, you know, I do get curious about my part in the relationship as well, whether I get them to journal because I sometimes find it difficult to connect when they're very emotional because I'm a very thinker. Mm. you know what I mean so it, it's good for me as well to mm. to get something from the client when we're working together okay I sometimes That's feel a bit cool. overwhelmed in the room when there's lots of emotions going on yeah yes yeah. Like you'd work well with these people yeah I, I I love working with them yeah so what are we doing next week Bob we've we've we spoke are. about maybe anxious and depressed for the yeah. next yeah, how to work with the depressed client and how to work with the uh, anxious client will be the yeah. next. We've got things like eating disorders and we've got uh, sexual abuse survivors and we've got quite a lot of topics, but let's make the next two uh, working with the depressed client and working with the anxious client. Brilliant. They sort of go together in a way. Yeah, yeah. Until the next time, Bob, thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Speak to you soon. Bye you've been listening to the therapy show behind closed doors podcast we hope you enjoyed the show don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review we'll be back next week with another episode